Hello, everybody. Uh, we're back for this afternoon uh, talk. Uh, midday afternoon, right? Uh, for EPIs New York, uh, but EPIs for legacy industries. You are in the industry track on the industry stage. And uh, we will continue our talks that we've seen this morning about open banking, open EPIs, governance. And now we will see uh, like the challenge of EPI design in fintech, right? The challenge and opportunities for next generation of APIs. Um, and for that, we will have a, a speaker that is known in the in the industry that has been a writer for uh, Programmable Web a long time ago and being part of this industry uh, for a long time. And uh, who is um, actually, uh, if, if I don't say anything, if I'm not mistaken, you're so teaching or at least giving lectures and workshops on APIs, right, Jeremy? Uh, so how are you today? I am doing well. How are you doing today? <laughs> doing really well, really well. The, the community is there uh, for this event. And yes, yeah, so uh, what I propose is that you share your screen. Uh, you try to find the, the, the magic button. All right. That uh, seems awesome. to work. That, that seems to work. And the stage is yours for 25 minutes. We're really glad to have you, Jeremy. Enjoy. All right. Glad to be here as well. Thank you. All right. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. So as mentioned, we'll be discussing a particular industry, the, uh, the fintech industry. Um, let me focus today on just general topics of API designs and challenges and opportunities for those next generation uh, APIs in fintech. Those that we're starting to see, but the opportunities that's still there as this large industry um, in fintech and fintech APIs continue to grow. So today we're gonna go through a little bit of the modern history of fintech APIs. Then we're gonna get into some trends and tips for those of you who I assume are interested in building uh, APIs in FinTech. And then we'll get into those future prospects of where things can go from here. Uh, now I have to go through my most hated slide of any presentation, the About Me slide. Uh, yes, I've been in the world of APIs and FinTech for a very long time. I've been full-time in APIs for over 12 years. What I'm most well known for is Box. I was basically the, the first hire for their APIs and built out their whole initial developer program. Um, I was an early writer for Programmable Web. I've written over two dozen articles for them starting over 10 years ago. Uh, I've managed APIs and developer ecosystems and developer experiences in a wide range of industries from education technology to drones and the private space industry but also quite a bit of time in fintech. Uh, most notably, TradeShift, that's a supply chain company we're focused on invoicing, so we got involved there. And uh, today I'm managing a product team for a credit card platform, Deserve, which enables companies who wanna launch credit cards to do it much, much, much more easily with the magic of APIs. I'm also an advisor and consultant to many startups and startup accelerators in the API field as, all, as well as in uh, financial technology. So basically I've been doing a lot in the FinTech space and the API space, and I've been involved for many years. So I'd like to start by talking about a bit of that history and how we've made it to really what's looking like more of a golden age for FinTech APIs today. But I'm gonna have to start with some history not too far, but uh, let's see. Does anyone remember this EDI, the electronic uh, data interchange? For those of you who do remember EDI, there's a special API meetup group. Um, it's basically an emotional support group for those who have PTSD from having ever had to work with, with uh, EDI. No, so EDI is the electronic data in, in interchange. It's basically a means of exchanging business information through a standardized format. It made a lot of sense. It helped a lot of industries, a lot of companies communicate with financial data much more easily by having that consistent standard. But as you can see here, it's legacy. This thing goes back before the internet at a time when you can actually use EDI for faxing. And today it's still in use. So I've worked in modern tech companies where especially in the supply chain, you have to interact with some legacy companies and deal with legacy technology. It's a pain. In fact, there's only one person I know who actually likes EDI today. You know, who, who, who can I quote to say they like EDI? Yeah, seriously. I hope you never have to encounter it for those of you who haven't. 
But there's more going on in, in fintech, and there's more, there are more challenges we still have to overcome. Just going back less than 10 years ago, I trust that most of us remember Mint. It's still around. It's a personal finance site where you can connect Mint to your bank accounts, your credit cards. They can track all of your financial transactions and provide recommendations. In the early days, the way they did this is they had to, they made you provide your username and password for every financial institution you had. You had to provide that to Mint and trust that Mint could store that information securely. Besides the security concern around sharing your passwords, we all know OAuth is better just for this reason alone, um, there were reliability issues because Mint did this so that they could site scrape. So you were leaving your passwords in the hands of a third party. Um, if you ever update your password with a financial institution, it would be a disaster over at Mint, that thing would go haywire. And the data just wasn't really that reliable. And why was this happening? Why did we have to do this less secure, less optimal solution when trying to connect with banks, when API options and OAuth was available? Well, let's look at the perspective from a bank at the time. Yeah, I really like the bank's attitude towards you know enabling data for their users. Their whole sense during this time was we need to control the data. I saw a lot of this 10 years ago in the world of APIs. Many B2B companies were hesitant to open up APIs, thinking that they need to be in control until they saw it over and over and over again, that when you open up, um, you can enable an ecosystem, let others build tools on top of what you're providing and let you grow more easily and at less effort. But banks weren't really open to that idea until things were kind of forced on them. And earlier this morning, I saw there's already many talks on the topic of open API uh, on, on open banking. So I won't get into this too much, but basically laws, regulations started to come in saying that banks need to make information more accessible to their consumers and just to give them more ownership over their information. That combined with PSD2, that's a European regulation for electronic payment services. It's about making payments more secure, but also pushing banks to innovate and adapt new technologies. Um, these new requirements from the government, from the people, put pressure on banks to finally open up and move into what we know as the Open Banking Initiative. I'll note, however, that while open banking has pushed the banks to create APIs, well, it doesn't set a standard definition for what the APIs have to be. And we'll get to that in a moment. But we've seen very quickly the benefits, the transition from site scraping that companies like Mint and Yodely used to have to do to what companies like Plaid can do today with the magic of APIs and OAuth. So now if I wanna connect one bank account with another, if I wanna to go to a FinTech company and share information about a credit card or about a bank account, well, I don't have to share my passwords. Chase, American Express, they through Plaid just direct you to those companies. You log in with your username and password there. You share what information you're comfortable sharing in a controlled environment. We now have control over our data. We now have a better experience, a more reliable experience through APIs. So we have something that's more usable, more reliable, and with better security. Or to quote Austin Powers, it's really quite a groovy time. And I can't do it with a British accent. I can only do it with Seth Meyers' uh, Canadian accent. Now, going beyond open banking and enabling the banks, getting the banks to open up their data and provide APIs, there's a lot more going on in the financial industry, in that larger world of fintech. And I'm sure we've all seen an API here or there lying around like Stripe, Plaid, Marketa, the Square APIs now. Long story short, there's a lot else going on in fintech and in fintech APIs beyond open banking. Uh, and the good news also is that these other companies, the people in these spaces, they're really, really good at APIs. Basically, it's a good time for fintech, and it's a good time to be working on APIs and fintech. 
but also for those who are in the space or trying to get into the space, creating APIs in this industry, be advised that there's a high bar in the fintech industry for your APIs now. After all, Stripe, among the many that I'm sharing here, they're credited for the three column API documentation. Um, they really are thought leaders in the world of API design and the developer experience. In general, when I'm a consultant, if people are asking, you know, what to do, who do we benchmark? I always say, when in doubt, if you're not sure what to do, just ask, what would Stripe do? And there are other good APIs, of course. Um, you could also ask, what would Stripe have done in the past? But these are our benchmarks. They're setting the standards for what is a good API and a good developer experience. So I have to reiterate, if you're in this space, remember that there's a high bar. Um, but also, you just have those good benchmarks. Other good companies that have built APIs in this space, you can take a look at to see what makes sense in the industry. And ideally, in the world of fintech, if you're doing this, if you're benchmarking these other APIs, you can create that sort of consistency across APIs that enables better API aggregation and creates a better ecosystem as a whole. And that's what I want to get into next. For opportunities they want us to think about as we have good and better APIs in the world of fintech. How do we make it easier and easier for services to work together? It's a big topic, a consistent recommendation by those advocating APIs in, in our space is to always have that consistency across our APIs. Now in the financial industry, we actually have a history of standards to have consistency in our tech messaging. And sorry again for those who've worked on EDI, I know this can bring back some bad, painful memories, but we have these ISO formats, uh, ISO 8583, work on that quite a bit over at Deserve in the credit card space. Um, it's very relevant when it comes to credit card processing and the messaging when a credit card transaction takes place and going into the processor and the payment gateways. We also have ISO 222. Um, which is primarily about the clearance between banks during um, other, other during um, basically core wiring and bank to bank financial transactions. Um, but these are basically messaging standards in those legacy systems. And we've kind of seen this challenge before when it came to SOAP APIs to XML and JSON based APIs, that things got lighter weight, things got more casual, but that meant that we may have actually less consistency um, we have, you know, standards for our messaging across companies when it comes to how we define our APIs. Well, this is where I'd say, you know, APIs are treated less as a rule in design and more about guidelines. Yes, we have consistency in that most APIs are RESTful or under GraphQL now, um, but many dream of seeing APIs really consistent in naming conventions for the endpoints, so that if you're working on very similar APIs at different companies, it will be much, much, much easier to integrate with both at the same time. Um, and unfortunately, we're not there yet. Now, I wouldn't say it's because companies are being competitive. A lot of it is just they're figuring out their APIs. They're still coming up with new versions, and they're figuring out what API designs work the best and scale before they start to try to get consistency. Now today we are gonna to go through a few patterns that I've seen. Sometimes we do see certain consistencies across these FinTech APIs. We just haven't gotten to a point of full consistency. Yes, over in the world of open banking, if you look at companies like Swift, which help banks create solid APIs under open banking, well, if it's the same company helping out each bank, they may help to establish consistency. So each bank is very similar. And we'll get more into tools like that. Um, what I also want to talk about is consistency and standards. So there are many APIs we can look at in the world of FinTech. Today, I just want to focus on not the standards of the banks, but among those popular APIs, the Stripe, Squares, the Marquetas, and identify patterns and trends. So we're going to do this both to see what is the bar, what are the expectations if you want to launch a FinTech API today, um, and then also, what should you be thinking about? What can you do if you're building new APIs to support the dream of consistency across FinTech APIs through the APIs that you're building as well? As an example, 
there are a few things here or there that we do see consistently across fintech APIs today, um, especially when it comes to certain property formats like currency. Basically, everyone figured out just use an integer, don't use a floating point to represent your pennies. It's much easier to store, easier to read, easier to calculate. So we see a few things like this, properties, date conventions, um, currency uh, type identifications. Uh, we'll see some consistently in those properties. And when you're launching an API, I encourage you to take a look at how each property type is defined. There, that's the easy part to get consistency. Where we see less consistency, I'd say it's when it comes to the object definitions and the endpoint definitions. Simply defining a balance, mm, this is where you see things are just not going to be aligned across APIs. Also, there is the topic of REST APIs versus GraphQL APIs. If you go to Braintree right now, they're looking more into visibly the GraphQL APIs for, for their consumers. So over here, what I would recommend is just benchmark. See what all the other APIs are doing and see what you can do to keep things consistent. And of course, um, make sure to either keep RESTful architecture or you know, if you're going with GraphQL APIs, try to go with the standard that you're seeing across the board. But just stay RESTful and see what you can do to align and just watch the trends as they happen as future APIs may get more and more aligned in endpoint naming and endpoint definitions. Now, there are certain other traits to just expect in FinTech APIs. And, and this becomes more a matter of setting the bar than having just consistency in the API structure. But you will see that FinTech companies really, really like and really need item potency. Basically, when making a post request, like creating a new charge, um, adding a payment method, making a payment on your credit card, um, what you'll want to do is, you know, in that case where you make a post request and it goes through, but you don't get a reply, well, it's a tough spot. And we want to make sure the developer knows they can recent the request to make sure it went through without the risk of making a duplicate payment. So uh, the item potency key for post requests, that's something you are seeing across the board. Uh, we have to care a lot about security and also just making sure that our developer community doesn't screw up when it comes to people's personal finances. Speaking of security, OAuth would be expected as a standard, but we've seen some other interesting patterns happening for FinTech APIs. Yes, for anything consumer facing, that could be Stripe Connect, where merchants are providing an interface for their users. That could be Plaid, OAuth 100% is the standard. Also, we tend to see the API secrets encrypted, um, the time-based signatures that, you know, that's not 100% required in OAuth 2, but uh, is the best practice. It's pretty much seemingly expected in the world of FinTech APIs. That said, it's also common in APIs to not have just a client to server and consumer to API relationship. It's very common for APIs to operate more behind the scenes in a server to server relationship. Marketa is a great example of this, where a user is likely to just interact with a partner. When they're interacting with, on a mobile app with a partner, that partner's mobile app may not connect directly to the Marketa API, and instead more likely is going through their own servers for server to server interaction. When you have server to server APIs, yeah, basic authentication is more common. In fact, we've seen Marketa and Stripe then provide both basic auth and OAuth, depending on the feature you're using. Basic auth is expected often for most of their APIs if it's primarily server to server, but for things like Stripe Connect or Marketa.js, that's Marketa's client side widgets, that's where you're certainly seeing OAuth. And likewise, once you have this challenge of partner to partner, B2B set of APIs, server to server APIs. Well, you have these administrative tokens, but you also have these user operations. So obviously we can transition then from authentication to what's happening with authorization. And you tend to see a lot of um, administrative tokens to perform high level master operations 
We'll also use our tokens in single use tokens. In Marquette's case, many, many, many of their operations are administrative operations, creating debit cards, creating users, all of that is handled through administrative tokens, server to server. But especially when it comes to client to server, as that had been added more and more to the experience where a mobile app may connect directly to the Marquetta APIs. What we're seeing more there is the need for not just user level tokens, but single use tokens. I find when in doubt, you'll really want authorization at the start, having administrative tokens to obtain user level tokens. This is often debated. Sometimes certain APIs decide that they have more of a use case for administrative tokens, but I would say just be ready at the start. This is one industry where authorization and admin to user level access is going to be vital. Also, outside of API design, just something you can expect to need are sandboxes. Uh, all of top FinTech APIs tend to be really deeply invested in having an easy to use sandbox. You can switch from sandbox to production because, well, if you're building an application that involves financial transactions, you wanna make sure that you're not screwing up through a very nice test environment right off the bat. So. That just makes a lot of sense. Be ready for the sandbox. Now, this, these are the trends I'm seeing where we have a high bar, we have a lot of good quality APIs, we're trying to get consistency, but there are challenges. Part of it is that we're still experimenting with our APIs. Part of it is just that there isn't enough of an incentive to build consistent APIs perhaps. When you have companies helping the banks with open banking, yeah, they can ensure more consistent APIs across financial institutions. But what else are we seeing? Getting creative to help drive that consistency dream. Well, I'd love to just highlight what Plaid is doing. Plaid is being a bit of an aggregator. You know, they're connecting to various financial institutions to allow a user to connect to one bank and another and get all their information in, in one area. And they've had something for a while, but they announced this more official tool fairly recently Plaid Exchange, which is basically saying to any fintech company who wants to connect with Plaid to be part of the Plaid user experience, great, they're gonna make it easy for you um, by giving you instructions as to how to create an API that plugs right into Plaid. Plaid basically has established their API standards and say if you build your APIs this way, you can plug into our system. And now they're giving that incentive, the ecosystem system is forming with more and more of an incentive to get APIs consistent, easier to work across, easier for aggregation and aggregating tools like Plaid to happen. Uh, and this is really what I'm hoping to see more of. I think uh, Ito over at Rapid API is going to talk about this uh, a little bit more as well uh, in, in his session in a moment. But I hope this, this um, is something you can all think about. How do you keep the quality up in this now competitive world where the standards are high? And what else can you do to keep that bar high, collaborate with others in the space so we can create an even better, more collaborative, more consistent FinTech ecosystem? Thank you all for putting up with me for a little over 20 minutes. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. One question about the importance of design. Uh, to, to your mind, when uh, some, uh, let's say, fintechs just deliver business process as a service, like a, a transactional API, sometimes we call them like uh, payments or fraud detection or uh, scoring or whatever. Uh, how do you see EP, uh, the design of the APIs as a competitive advantage? Is it the game changer or is it, uh, is it just a nice to have? How do you see it? You know, in the world of uh, product management, we talk about the Kano model, where sometimes people don't expect things to be a certain way. Like, you know, years ago at Box, our APIs initially weren't RESTful. Our documentation wasn't where we wanted it to be. But people loved us because we still designed our APIs according to use case, and we provided good developer support. And compared to others in the industry, we were pretty good. Uh, Box's APIs then, well, they need to be updated and they did so because the expectations of our consumers, of our developers has risen. So I would say today it's gone from, especially in the world of FinTech, 
it's not a competitive advantage as much as it is an expectation now. I don't have time to explain uh, the Kano model, but basically sometimes you can delight people and surprise people with things that they don't expect. Now in FinTech, good APIs have become expected behavior. You may find a niche area, but be advised, this is a space where the standards are high. And so if you start with the weak API, someone else is gonna come in and crush you. It's this case where if you don't have good APIs, you're gonna get beaten. More than a case that if you have great APIs, you're guaranteed to win. There's a lot of things here, but among the many, just assume your APIs have to be really nice. Yeah, it reminds me the a quote of uh, uh, Jeff Bezos on product who says that, uh, like, don't don't focus on competition. Competitors will never give you any money. Uh, focus on customers, <laughs> right? Focus on customers. That's the most important. And it seems you are saying the same for API design. Don't focus on competitors' API design. They will never integrate with you. Focus on developers and your ecosystem. The, these are the ones that will integrate with you. Here I see your competitors as good benchmarks, not even to compete against, but you know the bar is high and this is to create a good ecosystem. Work with them. I love to see more collaboration. But yes, focus on your customers and just know that your customers now are expecting good APIs. Yeah, thank you very much. Just maybe uh, uh, where where can we find some, some things about what you do or the company you work on or maybe like some, some writings you, you've done recently? Sure. So I would check out, um, first of all, deservecards.com. Maybe I can type it in there. That's that's the credit card company that I work for. Uh, you can you know just find me on LinkedIn, just Jay Glassmer. Feel free to ping me if you have just general API questions. I'm always happy to chat APIs. Um, in terms of publications, you know I have a series coming out on um, embedded integration frameworks, but uh, I'm actually talking to a few different channels, so I'm not sure where it's going to be published, but uh, keep keep a lookout. I guess if anyone else is interested, I have some uh, app script samples being posted for uh, Google's G Suite, uh, highlighting some interesting things you can do with Google APIs, which does include something Google Finance and FinTech related. So just uh, take a look at the G Suite gallery. Um, you'll see something there very soon. Perfect. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Have a good one. And thank you for this talk about design challenges for FinTech. Thank you.